So I want to welcome everyone to Arizona State Museum Zoom talk series. I'm Lisa Falk. I'm head of community engagement for the museum, and I'm serving as the host for this series and this afternoon. As many of you know, Arizona State Museum is part of the University of Arizona, located in Tucson on the ancestral lands of the Tana Atom Nation and the Pascuayaki tribe. The museum's collections and research focus on the indigenous peoples of the Southwest and Northwest Mexico, and we present programs exploring the history and cultures of this region. This spring, we've off, been offering a diversity of topics and speakers in our Zoom series. And this month, we are focusing on the history, politics, and legalities associated with land and water in Arizona, as well as stories of people and communities who have both impacted and been impacted by changes in land, water, and legal policies. Today, I'm happy to welcome my colleague, Dr. Michael Brescia, who's a curator of ethno history, excuse me, at the museum. He holds faculty affiliations in the Department of History in the James E. Rogers College of Law at the University of Arizona. He teaches a wide range of courses, including Mexican history, borderlands history, and a comparative history of North, North America. At the Arizona State Museum, Michael was lead curator for many Mexicos, Visitas de la Frontera, which the, it was an exhibit that the American Association of State and Local History awarded a Leadership and History Award of Merit in 2012. Dr. Brescia is the co-author of two books that examine the broader historical forces that have shaped our continent since pre-Columbian times to the present. And in addition to being a Fulbright scholar, his research and scholarship has been recognized over the years by various organizations, including the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society, the Archery Museum of American West, the Arizona Historical Records Advisory Board, and the Gernot Hempel Foundation in Germany. Before we turn to Dr. Brescia, let me explain how the Q&A works. Those of you who've been here before know, but if you have a question for Dr. Brescia, please write it in the Q&A area. You can put other comments in the chat, but your questions, please put in the Q&A uh, area at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of his presentation, I will post your questions to him because with so many in attendance, we'll get through more questions this way. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Brescia. Well, thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for zooming in today to hear my presentation. Your support of the Arizona State Museum is crucial to our mission to preserve, create, and share knowledge about the peoples and cultures of Arizona, the greater Southwest, and Mexico. This speaker series that my colleague Lisa Falk has developed aspires to create authentic, life enriching experiences that broaden perspectives about and encourage respect for the cultural diversity that fashions our state and our nation. I want to thank Lisa for inviting me to give the, the inaugural lecture in this three part lecture series. Uh, this promises to be an informative and engaging series of lectures and discussions around two primary features of Mother Nature, land and water. My experiences reflect 25 years of work, first as a graduate student research assistant and later as a formal consultant and expert witness on several water rights disputes with deep roots in the Arizona and New Mexico historical experiences. And it's a topic that bridges the histories of Spain, Mexico and the United States in intriguing ways that many folks just don't know about because it's not regularly taught in the schools. I want to begin this presentation by sharing my first story. It was the summer of 2009 and I was preparing to give my very first deposition as an expert witness in a water rights case in northern New Mexico, specifically the Chimayo Española area. There, not surprisingly, just like throughout the American West, multiple parties, multiple competitors want and indeed need water to sustain their daily activities like farming, ranching, drinking water, water to support businesses and tourism and economic development. My client was an acequia community. And you see the word there in Spanish, acequia. And right below it, you actually see 
a picture of an acequia. And the gentleman there in the red shirt, he, he is known in Spanish as a mayordomo or a foreman. He is the manager of the acequia, which it's a Spanish word. It actually comes from an old Arabic word meaning canal or ditch. And these acequias, these canals, these ditches draw water from the tributaries of the Rio Grande. It's an irrigation system, these acequias, that date to 1598. That is when Spaniards arrived in northern New Mexico. The attorney representing the acequia community, he and I agreed a few years earlier that I should interact as much as possible, as much as I could, with the largely Hispanic farmers and irrigators who rely on adequate access to that most precious resource. The idea was to avoid being an armchair historian. I don't know if you heard that expression before. I use it all the time with my students, armchair historian. That's a scholar who just sits in a library and archive, although that's very important. That is our bread and butter, sitting in an archive and reading old documents, but totally detached from the area that they're studying or the people that they're studying, the land, the environment, the language, the culture. He said, we need to avoid being an armchair historian because he was afraid that when I got deposed, the opposing attorneys would say, have you ever visited Chimayo? Do you know any of these farmers and irrigators and ranchers? Have you ever walked in Asakia? Have you ever touched the waters of an Asakia? So that was the idea behind these regular visits that I was making to Española Chimayo, Chimayo. And you see the map there, those two areas, there's all these Native American Pueblos that are there too. So all of those Pueblos compete for water. So I got in my car and I followed the attorney and we navigated our way along dirt roads and dusty, very narrow alleyways. We crisscrossed the beautiful landscapes of Española and Chimayo. We stopped at the home of a local farmer who was out in the field inspecting his crops and taking care of the waters uh, that were irrigating those crops. He grew a variety of vegetables and fruits, including lettuce and cucumbers, uh, obviously New Mexican green chili you see up there on the slide. He also grew bell peppers and apples. He was an older gentleman, I'd say early to mid 70s. And when he saw us coming, he was expecting us. When he saw us coming, he immediately called out to his grandson in Spanish, Mijo, ayúdame, por favor. Ya viene el abogado y el historiador. Llena una bolsa con manzanas y verduras para ellos. In English, the rough translation, son, he literally called him son, Mijo, although it was his grandson. Son, please help me fill a bag with apples and vegetables because the lawyer and the historian have arrived. The grandson immediately began to fill two big burlap bags with cucumbers, bell peppers, green and red chilies, and apples. He handed them to us, he handed them to his grandfather, who in turn handed each of us a bag filled with the fruits of his labor. And then he turned to me and said, Ya sé que usted está luchando por mí y por mi familia y nuestros derechos al agua. Entonces quiero expresarle las gracias profundas por sus esfuerzos. Again, a rough English translation. I know that you are fighting for me and my family and our water rights. So I want to express my profound thanks to you for your efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish that I can adequately express, I wish I could adequately describe to you what I felt at that moment. The best I can do is to tell you that a wave of emotions overcame me. In all my years as a historian up to that point, I had never really considered the impact of my research on people's lives. It always seemed theoretical, routine, even mundane. I go to the archives, I head to the library, 
I use historical method that I learned in graduate school. I use historical method to identify old documents and rare books that can help me address the research question that needs an answer. I write up my findings and I submit them to a group of experts who evaluate the arguments and my use of evidence and then decide whether or not it gets published. This is the hallmark of academic research, what we call the peer review process that helps the scholarly community to distinguish between evidence-based arguments and fake news. So if your book or article gets accepted, it occupies a prominent line on your resume, what we call at the university a CV. And hopefully it helps you earn tenure and get, get you promoted. No doubt there is intrinsic satisfaction that accompanies academic research and publication. But serving as a consultant and expert witness can have consequences and an impact that go far beyond an academic resume. I had never experienced this impact. I had never seen or heard of this impact until that New Mexican abuelo, that grandfather in Northern New Mexico approached me with a bag of fruits and vegetables that he had grown in his own huerta, his own garden or orchard. I had a lump in my throat and I felt flush in the face as I tried to find elegant words in response. And all I could mumble was, muchas gracias, muy amable. Many thanks, you're very kind. But the abuelo's kindness, his generosity cut deep into me, a feeling that fashioned both my heart and the intellect. So how did I become a consultant and expert witnesses an expert witness in these water rights cases. As a historian, my specialty is colonial Mexico, which means I study the history of Mexico from the early 16th century to the early to mid 19th century. Of course, there's some overlap. I also study pre-Columbian Mexico, and I also study mid to late 19th century Mexico. But I am a historian whose expertise resides in the history of colonial Mexico. And I'm being asked by my clients, and in the case of Northern New Mexico, these are primarily Hispanic farmers and irrigators, but I also have a client in Arizona that I'll talk about later, the Navajo Nation. And I'm being asked by these groups to explain a foreign legal system to American judges and attorneys. Mexican law derives from Spanish law since Mexico was a colony of Spain for 300 years. Unlike US law, which comes primarily from English common law. American judges and attorneys, therefore, are educated and socialized in common law understandings of property rights and natural resources. Whereas Spanish and Mexican law derives from civil law and civil law comes from Roman law. Now, don't worry, we're going to look uh, at these distinctions a bit more carefully in a few moments. So how did old Spanish and Mexican law come to have relevance and significance in the Southwest? In fact, throughout the American West? Well, to answer that question, we need to go back to the mid 19th century when a young United States invaded Mexico and occupied Mexico in 1846 and sequestered half of Mexico's national territory. And you see the map there. All the area in green was ceded to the United States under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The little blue sliver there, uh, south of the Gila River is the Gadsden Purchase. And of course, Texas was part of Mexico. So when you look at the red, green, and blue, that is half of Mexico's territory in the mid 19th century. So the peace treaty that ended the American invasion is called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and it was signed in 1848. That treaty obliged and continues to oblige the United States to respect the property of those Mexicans who through no fault of their own 
suddenly woke up on February 2nd, 1848, and owed allegiance not to Mexico City, but to Washington, D.C. Mexicans living in California, most of Arizona, New Mexico, Southern Colorado, they were provided with property guarantees best appreciated in Article 8 of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And that is what you see on the slide, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is a bilingual treaty. And this is, uh, you see the handwriting there, it's two columns, Article 8, Articolo 8, or El Octavo Articolo. So, and Article 8 is key to understanding these property guarantees. I'm gonna give you just a little quote from Article 8. Here's the English. Property of every kind now belonging to Mexicans shall be inviolably respected. You can't get more clear in what kind of property was protected. All kind of property, every kind of property under Mexican law would now be protected by this treaty, United States government. A few years later in 1853, and then it was signed in 1854, in an effort to secure land to connect Texas and California by rail, the United States acquired Southern Arizona. You see this dead little blue sliver. The US acquired Southern Arizona and Southwestern New Mexico in the Gadsden Purchase. Although in Mexico, it's known as La Benta de Mesilla because much of the territory is known as the Mesilla Valley or the El Valle de Mesilla. Article five of the Gadsden Purchase provided identical property guarantees as Article 8 did under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. In fact, those who negotiated the Gadsden Purchase, they were not shy in admitting they plagiarized Article 8 of the treaty. They just say, Article 5 of the Gadsden Purchase is identical to Article 8 of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And what does that mean for those living, uh, folks living south of the Gila River, that every kind of property that they possessed would now be respected and guaranteed by the US government. In sum, these two international treaties taken together allow the United States to fulfill its manifest destiny for just under $30 million. And by doing so, the United States was able to go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, or as the song has it, from sea to shining sea. While Mexico was cut in half and slid further into political chaos. Of course, we know from American history, the United States also had chaotic, chaotic time with the US Civil War, 1861, 1865. Another crucial question to consider, and that what I consider as an expert witness, what are other factors that promote the role of Spanish law in the US legal system? Well, international law plays an important uh, part here. And I wanna discuss a little bit about international law. It has two important components that help us to better understand the significance of old Spanish law in the United States. And there are two doctrines, the doctrine of state succession and the doctrine of prior sovereigns. They're very much, they're, they, they overlap each other and you'll see this as I go on with the lecture. So I wanna briefly situate now these two international treaties, Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Gadsden Purchase within the context, the broader context of international law because international law is quite explicit on issues related to territorial change, different legal cultures, and property rights. The law of state succession or the doctrine of state succession is a fundamental part of international law. Its major objective is to curtail, to limit the most egregious negative effects of territorial change. The legal reasoning that underpins this law of state succession is actually quite neat and tidy and simple. Property rights acquired under a former sovereign must be respected by the successor state. But what does that legalese mean? Well, in, in my research as an expert witness, the law of state succession is saying 
that the United States, as the successor of Mexico, is obliged to respect the property rights of those Mexicans and all of their heirs and successors. So what does that mean? That means even if an Anglo, a white American, bought the property from the Mexican after 1848, that American person, that American farmer or rancher would have the same guarantees. So the law of state succession is saying that the United States is obliged to respect the property rights of those Mexicans and their heirs and successors who suddenly found themselves living north of the newly created border. But what if the United States wanted to alter or modify or abolish those property rights? International law says that it could do so, it can do so, only if legislation to change or eliminate those rights are explicit and precise and compensation is offered. While this discussion of international law might seem abstract, the guiding principle that an area's change of sovereignty alters public law, but leaves intact private law, and I'm thinking here specifically property rights, has deep roots in the American historical experience. Take a look at this map here. Think back to your uh, high school and college history courses. In 1803, Thomas Jefferson negotiated with, uh, President Thomas Jefferson negotiated with Napoleon and acquired the Louisiana Territory, right? The Louisiana Purchase of 1803. But what about all those French citizens living in the city of New Orleans? What happened to their property? Well, they continued to enjoy their property as if Louisiana was still under the French flag. Take a look at the uh, Florida Peninsula. Florida became part of the United States under the adams onice Treaty of 1819. The United States bought Florida from Spain. What about those Spaniards living in Florida? What happened to their property? They still enjoyed their property as if Florida still was under the Spanish flag. When a test case reached the US Supreme Court in 1853, Chief Justice John Marshall concluded that the property guarantees afforded to individuals apply equally if Florida had been acquired by conquest or by peace treaty. So it didn't matter whether the United States invaded Florida or purchased it outright, the property guarantees applied equally. So in the broader context of international law, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Gadsden Purchase are classic examples of applying the doctrine of state succession and the doctrine of prior sovereigns to citizens prejudiced by a change of territorial possession. In 1848 and again in 1854, the United States assumed the obligation to adjudicate property rights acquired under the prior sovereign Mexico. And not only to adjudicate those property rights, but to do so in the very same manner had the territory not changed hands. That means in effect that Spanish property law entered American courtrooms and legislative bodies despite differences between the common law and civil law understandings of property rights. As a consequence, the distance between academic research and expert witness testimony has been all too brief, as historians like myself try to navigate multiple streams of statutory law and case law from one legal tradition, the legal tradition of Spain and Mexico, in an effort to inform attorneys and judges who are educated and socialized in another legal tradition, that's the common law bequeathed by England. Historians who serve as expert witnesses often find it difficult to introduce nuance and complexity when they are deposed or if they give testimony at a trial. For example, the property rights that people enjoyed in Arizona under the old laws of Spain and Mexico emerged from a broader regimen 
of laws, customs, and usages that reflected the influences of Roman law, canon law, and canon law is the law of the Roman Catholic Church, Visigothic law, the Visigoths were the Germanic uh, communities, the tr so-called Germanic tribes that brought down the Roman Empire and went as far all the way into the Iberian Peninsula, and of course, Islamic law, because much of Spain was under Islam for hundreds of, uh, know, hundreds of years. So the development of, of the so-called Hispanic legal tradition reflects Roman law, canon law, Visigothic law, and Islamic law. In the civil law system, the law is collected and codified in compilations rather than determined by a judge. Its primary source is legislation written and passed by a legislative body or issued by an executive, like a president or a monarch. Think of a, when, I, when you hear the word compilation, I tell my students, think about those old three ring binders. Well, I still use them, so I don't, I don't see them as old, but to my students, it's as foreign as something out of Mars, right? But think of it as a three ring binder that contains all the laws related to a particular topic. And then you slap on a label and you call it, let's say water law. And then you have another binder with all the laws related to families. That's family law. Then you have a binder, everything related to crime. That's criminal law. That is the civil law tradition. It's often called code law in Spanish, el código, el código civil, the civil code, el código penal, the criminal code. On the other hand, in British North America, common law governed uh, property rights. And in that legal system, judges can make law when they decide a case, which in turn can establish precedent that binds future decisions if the elements of the case are similar. There's actually a Latin term for that, stare decisis. On the other hand, if the elements of the case are different, Judges have the authority, even the duty, to make new law by creating precedent. The property rights tradition that evolved in Spain and later Mexico classified natural resources as property in ways that were quite distinct from Anglo and then Anglo-American common law, thus ensuring confusion after 1848 when disputes arose over the nature and scope of Spanish and Mexican property rights in the newly acquired territories. In the US legal system, uh, we speak of riparian rights. Well, not just in the legal system. Uh, anyone who studies ecology, hydrology, you hear the word riparian. I, I'm from the East Coast, so the word riparian shows up a lot in places like New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, West Virginia. Uh, in the West, places like Arizona, California, uh, uh, Utah, Nevada, you use terms like prior appropriation instead of riparian. Prior appropriation is first in time, first in right. And that is sort of an innovation in American common law. So if you got there first, you got that you had a better right to use the water or to mine for silver or copper. Well, these concepts, riparian rights and prior appropriation have no identical counterpart in the Spanish civil law of property. Spanish jurisprudence recognized three kinds of property rights that are fundamental to understanding the intersection of law and economic activities in places like Arizona, New Mexico, Southern Colorado, Texas, and California, which were once part of the Spanish dominion in North America. And I put them up on the slide. So the first one we're gonna look at today is propiedad imperfecta. Now a literal translation of that is imperfect property. But as I tell my students, literal translations often don't work. They have, there's some, there's some good that can come out of them, but Think of propia, propiedad imperfecta as a property right that was subject to qualification and measured against the rights of others. 
For example, unlike Anglo-American common law, the Spanish civil law did not recognize riparian rights to running rivers, streams, and creeks. If a piece of property fronted on a river, the owner could only use the water for domestic purposes and not for irrigation and not for industrial activities. The Spanish crown and later an independent Mexico conveyed rights to surface water for agricultural industrial purposes by several mechanisms, by way of several mechanisms. It could be a water grant, which was known as a merced de agua, a, a grant of water. They were this, uh, these water grants were not very common on the northern frontier. Uh, you find them more in central Mexico and north central Mexico. Another mechanism was a procedure that divided the surface water according to certain criteria, such as need, intent, legal right, uh, just title. And that was known as repartimiento de aguas, literally dividing the waters. Another mechanism that would give you a right to surface water was the composición, literally a composition. But what it is, it was a judicial process of authenticating asserted water rights. It was very bureaucratic and very lengthy, and it, most folks tried to avoid a composición. Generally, though, the mechanism that was more often than not used to convey surface water was if the title, the deed, the land grant itself contained language that conveyed water rights for irrigation. And I put some examples there under the first bullet. If your title, if your property deed had the words tierras de pan llevar or tierras de labor, literally that means lands that carry wheat, lands that carry bread, or worked lands, lands that are labored. Again, those are literal translations. How do I translate tierras de pan llevar and tierras de labor? Irrigable land, irrigable land. That land could be irrigated by using water from a stream, a creek, a river. The second property right, propiedad perfecta, literally a perfect property right. And now this time, the literal translation works a little better. Ownership of spring water, rainwater, snow melt, or water percolating under the ground was nearly absolute. And landowners could not be easily deprived of these waters once conveyance was extended by competent authority, even if use of such water caused damage to neighbors. Here's the interesting part, though. There are very few disputes over groundwater during the Spanish colonial period. And that tells me that the early science of hydrology, right, hydrology is the science of water, the early science of hydrology had not yet informed jurisprudence in the early modern world. Most disputes in the documentary record, most disputes that I find in the archives reflect concerns over access to surface water rather than groundwater. The third property right is propiedad usufructuaria, or usufructory property. So that rounds out the third property right under the old Hispanic civil law. Usufruct is the right to use and enjoy the property of another and to draw profit from it, provided that by doing so, you neither alter nor eliminate the purpose or substance of the property being used. Now, in the case of Spanish New Mexico, usufructory property was manifest in the common lands that were attached to Spanish towns, Indian pueblos, and informal farming communities known as acequia communities. Common lands are not typically associated with Spanish Arizona. However, you could find common lands attached to presidios, those military garrisons, uh, the missions, the Spanish missions, the Catholic missions, but you didn't find common lands uh, issued with private property. In other words, individuals or families who received 
a private land grant usually did not have common lands attached to them. And most of the land grants in Arizona were issued to private individuals or families. Individual citizens in Spanish, vecinos, that also means neighbors, but back in the Spanish period it meant citizens. Individual citizens residing in a town or indigenous peoples living in their pueblos enjoyed a property interest in the common lands, which were used for recreation, hunting, fishing, for grazing livestock, for the gathering of wild fruits and nuts, and also for the watering of livestock, not just grazing, but watering your livestock, and for cutting wood. Citizens of the community, whether you were rich or poor, enjoy equal access to the commons. And in Spanish, they show up in the historical record uh, with the language ejidos. Sometimes you see montes. So ejidos or montes were the common lands. In fact, most Spanish settlers would have found it difficult to make a living and support their families without regular access to the commons. The activities that I just cited above, all of the uh, you know, cutting wood and grazing your livestock and gathering wild fruits and nuts, all of those activities were used to fructory property rights. And although our understanding of these rights is not nearly as nuanced as our knowledge of water rights, it is clear from the statutory and case law that Spanish jurisprudence recognized them as such. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, however, U.S. courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, failed to identify and recognize the common lands as a usufructory property right. And in the case of New Mexico, many New Mexico, uh, many of the New Mexican communities lost their common lands. Those lands transferred over and remain today part of the National Forest Service. So of these Mexican families, these Hispanic families, want to graze their livestock, they have to pay uh, permits. They have to pay for a permit, a grazing permit from the National Forest Service to graze on lands that once belonged to their ancestors. Now, in the past year, we have been debating the U.S. Constitution and the impeachment provisions that govern the removal of a president, of the president, I should say. Well, in the case of my research, as an expert witness, I also look at the US Constitution and I'm interested in Article 6, Section 2, because Article 6, Section 2 supports a crucial argument that I make about the role of treaties in American law and American society. When the largely Hispanic communities in Northern New Mexico invoke their property rights under the old laws of Spain and Mexico, they do so within a constitutional framework that is too often made implicit rather than explicit. And again, I'm referring here to Article 6, Section 2. I'm actually going to read it to you. This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land and judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. Put that more succinctly, the Constitution elevates treaties like Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Gadsden Purchase to the same level as the Constitution itself. Therefore, those treaties are the supreme law of the land. I want to share with you now a few crucial and poignant lines from a document that dates to the early 19th century, the early 1800s, because it conveys the indigenous voice. We should always keep in mind that the historical records that historians and anthropologists use were created under the Spanish and later Mexican legal systems, and that native voices, native perspectives, and native expressions of identity and justice were filtered through Spanish and Mexican scribes, notaries, clerks, missionaries, 
attorneys and judges who are at the top of the political and social pyramids. This is not to say that indigenous peoples were unable to defend their property interests or their rights to natural resources. On the contrary, indigenous peoples were quite adept at using the Spanish colonial system to assert and defend their rights and interests. But as I tell my students, the system was designed to benefit the mother country, Spain. And Spaniards generally viewed indigenous peoples as a means to an end. That is to enrich the Spanish empire, extend Spanish sovereignty around the globe and evangelize, convert indigenous peoples to Christianity. So this uh, brief lines that I want, a few lines I want to share with you comes from the Oque Wingue Pueblo. Spaniards called it San Juan Pueblo, but uh, in the 20th century, uh, these indigenous communities decided to say, we're going to go back to the name we feel comfortable with. We want to identify as Oque Wingue. And this story involves a story of a measurement of land. And that measurement is known as a league. Under Spanish law, the traditional land base of native peoples was recognized and generally agreed upon to be one square league going in all of the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Now, a league general was, uh, the measurement was about 2.6 miles, or if you like kilometers, 4.2 kilometers. So one league extended 2.6 miles, and again, it went in, in the four cardinal directions, so that's why they called it a square, a four-square league. In the case of San Juan Pueblo, however, the documentary record tells us that Oque Wingue Pueblo, that their land base was smaller than a four square league. So what did, what did the documentary record, what does it tell us? How do we know this? Well, San Juan Pueblo neither received nor was assigned a conventional four square league, or if they were assigned, it was chipped away, it was taken from them. And I point to a document that comes from the archives. It dates to 1821. And it's a document written by this indigenous community, San Juan Pueblo, today, OK Wingue. And it was addressed to the Comandante General, or the Commandant General down in Chihuahua, which is south of New Mexico today. The leadership of the Pueblo was concerned about a bando. Now, a bando was a proclamation that was issued by competent authority, by, by a, a, a Spanish official. And in their complaint, the indigenous peoples of O.K. Wingay says, and I'm quoting now from it in a rough English translation, having read to us a proclamation that says that the Pueblo land should be reduced and San Juan Pueblo being one of those Pueblos and the land that we enjoy is so little that not in any direction does it have a league as was ordered by the old Spanish kings. And we have been obeying it because of having been such loyal subjects, more loyal than the other Pueblos where they have a full league, end quote. Well, upon receiving the complaint, the Commandant General in Chihuahua, whose name was, uh, his last name was Garcia Conde, he ordered the governor of New Mexico to make no changes to the land base belonging to Oque Wingue, the San Juan Pueblo. This important document, written at a time when Mexico was transitioning from being a colony to an independent nation, reveals that San Juan Pueblo did not have a four square league. The Pueblo's leadership took action to prevent a further reduction in their land base that was never four square leagues in measurement. Also keep in mind that the Spanish officials, the Spanish official who acted on the complaint, this Commandant General, while he stipulated that the proclamation would not be implemented at San Juan Pueblo, he did not increase the land base he could have done so in the interests of justice and equity, which were legal principles under Spanish law. 
he could have said San Juan Pueblo should have a four square league just like the other Pueblos do. He decided to simply halt the implementation of the proclamation and to halt the further reduction of O.K. Wingay's land base. So I guess you can say that San Juan Pueblo, O.K. Wingay won the battle but lost the war. Another group in the Southwest that I want to talk about has uh, been struggling for a long time for its rights to land, water, and other natural resources. And I'm thinking here about the Navajo Nation, which as you know, is the largest indigenous group in the United States, the largest reservation, about 14 million acres. There are approximately 300,000 enrolled members of the Navajo Nation. And out of that 300,000, about 173,000 actually live on the reservation. The, Na the Navajo Nation has an enormous natural resource base. The entirety of the nation's land base has been compared to the size of the state of West Virginia, one of my old stomping grounds back east. And it's kind of interesting that we make this comparison uh, that the Navajo Nation's land base can be compared to the state of West Virginia because just like West Virginia is known for coal, so is the Navajo Reservation. It rests on the Colorado Plateau and stretches from what is now Eastern New Mexico near the Chuska Mountains, west to the Colorado River, and from the south near Interstate 40 to the north into what is now the state of Utah. In addition to the reservation, the Navajo, the Navajo Nation has other lands that are part of its land base not located on the Colorado Plateau that stretch further east into New Mexico. And the, there's three communities in particular. They're referred to under Navajo law as chapters and they're located throughout what is now the state of New Mexico. They are the chapters of Rama near Gallup and Zuni Pueblo, Alamo near Socorro and Toal Vigili near Albuquerque known for, for those of you who like the Breaking Bad TV series, that's that region there. Underlying the Navajo reservation land is a vast supply of coal. There are currently two coal mines on the nation and those coal mines provide fuel to two coal fired power plants. Although there's always litigation going on, environmentalists. So those coal, those, fire, those power plants sometimes are not operative but often they are and then sometimes they shut down. It's a back and forth. At other times, a, uh, at, at what should I say, in the past, in the past, a large supply of uranium was heavily mined on the Navajo Nation's land during the Cold War era. And while there are no active uranium mines on the Navajo Nation today, there are approximately 521 abandoned uranium mines. The nation's natural resources make it unique among indigenous reservations but not unique when compared to states in the Western US. The Navajo Nation relies on royalties and taxes from its coal and timber, and that generates income that is put into the Navajo General Fund. And that is distinct from federal funding. Now, federal funding is an important source of revenue to the Navajo Nation, but it comes with many strings attached whereas the Navajo General Fund can be utilized at the discretion of the Navajo Nation. Navajo activists have long argued that the nation needs to move away from federal funding so that it can, it can engage in nation building on its own terms. In addition to coal, the Navajo Nation relies on the lease payments from the two power plants, payments for rights of way over its vast land base, oil and gas revenue, and taxes. All of those go into the general fund. Where the comparison with, with Western states end is that the Navajo Nation is none, nonetheless mired in extreme poverty. And as we know, indigenous peoples in general, their reservations are the poorest in sectors of the United States. Despite the massive potential for building a private economy from its natural resources. And perhaps even more critically, the Navajo Nation, unlike the Western states, is still engaged in battle over battle over battle 
over water rights and numerous conflicts over whether it has jurisdiction to regulate certain activity on its lands. What is at stake in the natural resource litigation ranges from the attainment of basic elements like water to the protection of a fragile and small economy that exists on the Navajo Nation. At the same time, the reservation is also consistently engaged in efforts, including litigation, to regulate activities on the reservation to advance its environmental goals. The nation is engaged in a variety of litigation concerning natural resources at all times. Due to the legal nature of water rights, the Navajo Nation is a party to four general stream adjudications. The purpose of these adjudications is to determine the quantity of water to which the Navajo Nation has a legal right. In addition, the nation has attempted to find ways to claim rights to the Colorado River, which borders the Navajo Nation and is the lifeline for seven Western states. Water rights litigation depends on expert witnesses. And experts include historians like myself, but also archeologists, anthropologists, hydrologists, economists, engineers, and agricultural and soil scientists. There is constant litigation concerning the coal mines or the power plants. What I wanna share with you now is a perspective that comes from a wonderful and gifted Navajo attorney, Bitta Becker, you see her on the screen there, who when I first met her back in 2009, she was an attorney in the Navajo Nation Water Rights Unit located in the capital of Navajo Nation, Window Rock. She then served as executive director of the Navajo Nation's Department of Natural Resources, which meant she was a member of the Navajo Nation's president's cabinet. And currently she is an attorney for the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. She shared with me her views and her perspectives. Of course, when we met, because I was the expert witness, but we also talked a lot on the phone. We met up a couple of times in person outside of litigation and we developed a friendship. And I was so taken by her perspective that I invited her to contribute. And you see this on the slide on the right-hand side. I served as guest editor of a special issue of a journal called The Public Historian. And the special issue was devoted to the, to the uh, subject of the historian as expert witness. Well, I had all these historians, but where was the attorney? So after listening to all these great stories and perspectives from Bitta Becker, I invited her to write a chapter or to write an article for this special issue, and she did. So that's what I am drawing on uh, in this next section. So she shared with me her views on the significance of the historian or the archeologist or the anthropologist who serves as an expert witness to the Navajo Nation. By calling on an expert to provide testimony, the attorney has identified an issue that requires an expert opinion rather than establish a fact. For example, when one party to the little Colorado litigation and I'm thinking specifically here, the Hopi tribe. When the Hopi tribe decided to argue for rights to water based on the old laws of Spain and Mexico, the Navajo Nation wanted to identify a historian who could assess those historical claims. We can certainly understand that the development of, of an opinion, of an expert opinion, is complex. And yet from the attorney's perspective, no matter how complex, the purpose of expert testimony is to relay an opinion in as efficient and clear a manner as possible. Unlike an eyewitness, the historian as expert witness offers an opinion to assist the court. And that opinion is by its nature subject to dispute. This is different from a contested fact where one witness testifies, for example, that the traffic light was red and another witness testifies that the traffic light was green. 
in which the court would have to determine who is telling the truth and find the fact. Typically, however, the type of case where the color of a traffic light is disputed, that will be a jury trial. And a jury of one's peers would be determining who is telling the truth. When looking for an expert witness, the first thing that an attorney will review is the potential expert's qualifications. The qualifications need to satisfy the court as well as the attorney, as well as the client, so that the court will recognize the person as an expert. In reflecting upon the role of the historian as expert in natural resource cases concerning a Navajo nation, Bitta Becker also personalized the phenomenon for me. She is a member of the Navajo nation and it has not been lost on Bitta that so much of the history of the Navajo people have been written by litigation experts, generally non-Navajos. Of particular note are the land claims that the Navajo Nation brought against the United States during the middle of the 20th century, and then the Navajo Hopi land and water dispute that also dates to the last century. In those cases, particularly in the early days, archeologists and anthropologists rather than historians did the research. But now historians have entered the process to address the documentary record rather than the archeological record. But because anything uncovered by the historian becomes confidential work product, it cannot be viewed, it cannot be viewed by just anybody. Bitta tells me that she finds it fascinating that today in the early 21st century, for someone to obtain access to what is probably the largest collection of primary materials on the history of the Navajo people, one has to obtain permission from the lawyers. She suspects that at the time the policy was developed, there may have been concerns about confidentiality and that the policy remains intact not because anyone remembers why the policy exists, but because it is hard to undo any bureaucratic requirement, even in a tribal government. Bitta also talked to me about an added layer of complexity to this dynamic of collecting and writing the history of the Navajo people. Up until very recently, that history was being written only by non-Navajos. In 1999, Jennifer Nez Dennettendale became the first Navajo to earn a PhD in history. Of personal note, and perhaps some bit of irony in light of, of what Bitta was saying, uh, Bitta first met Professor Dennettendale because the Navajo Nation retained her to serve as an expert witness in litigation. In 2007, Professor Dennettendale's book, Reclaiming Diné History was published. When her book tour came to the Navajo Nation, she was surprised at how many Navajos stood in line to buy the book and meet her. Bitta suspects that Professor Dinintale's presence and her book fill a void felt not only by Navajos, but by all indigenous peoples who have struggled to have their history conveyed as they understand it. As Bitta looks to the future, it is clear to her that extensive natural resources and environmental litigation will continue, therefore requiring the Navajo Nation's lawyers to continue to work closely with experts. It is not so clear to her that the expert will continue to have as large of an impact outside of the courtroom as on the academic study of the history of the Navajo people especially if Navajos follow Professor Dinintale's leadership, and for that matter, Bitta Becker's leadership, and join the university, join the legal profession. And finally, Bitta hopes that the Navajo Nation in the future will be able to retain experts from more disciplines who come from, who are enrolled members of the Navajo Nation. As we approach the end of my presentation, I wanna double back and share with you another personal story of my connection to the land and the water 
by way of history and law. In my 24 years of teaching at the college level, students have often asked me, uh, particularly graduate students, they have asked me to identify the most stressful time in my academic career. Many students assume that I'll say preparing for my dissertation defense, while others anticipate me responding the interview process, the interview process for a tenure track job or once hired, submitting your dossier for tenure and promotion, and then waiting nearly a year to find out the results. All of these activities, all of this, all of these phenomena, yes, cause stress. There's no two ways about it. But they all pale in comparison to the depositions that I have given in two water rights cases. Uh, I mentioned the Navajo Nation and the water right dispute between the Navajos and the Hopis, but all of the mining companies, the towns of Winslow and Holbrook, all of them the little Colorado watershed. They all want access, not just to the little Colorado surface water, but to the groundwater, to the aquifers. So I've been deposed in that case. And as I mentioned, I represent as the expert witness, uh, the Asequia communities, of Chimayo Española, and here are some examples of these acequias from Chimayo and Española. As the historian who has written reports assessing the water rights of indigenous and Mexican heritage peoples under the old laws of Spain and Mexico, I am obliged to subject my findings to scrutiny under the discovery rules that govern evidence in civil cases. Although there are, a number of, there are a number of articles and essays that shed some light on what to expect when you are deposed, and the attorneys representing the clients who contract my services offered guidance and perspective, I still held my breath as I took the first of what turned out to be a series of lengthy questions and sub-questions from about four or five attorneys. Quite frankly, the exact number escapes me, but they all were impeccably dressed and they drilled me over the course of six hours. We did get a lunch break. So it was about three hours and an hour lunch and then three hours. I've never been called doctor in a formal setting all those times that I did in those six hours of deposition. Dr. Brescia, Dr. Brescia, Dr. Brescia. They, they, they try to make it formal. So here I am, the examining attorneys are going after me six hours. And what I recall is the parsing of testimony, the revelation of stark differences in the basic reading of a written report and an effort to fluster the expert as part of a zealous defense of their client's rights. Truth be told, I cannot recall a similar experience in my professional life. Neither my dissertation defense nor tenure review even comes close to it. To be sure, academic job interviews are stressful even in a sound economy prior to COVID-19. But again, from my perspective, such experiences fail to compete with the deposition. I'm gonna give you a, share with you an anecdote. When you are deposed as an expert witness, you are told repeatedly, do not ask questions of the examining attorney. The attorney who is questioning you, examining you, do not ask the attorney questions. So in my New Mexico deposition, when I was representing the Aseki community, one of the lawyers, I'm like, there was about six of them, well, five of them. One of those lawyers asked me a question that I did not understand. And you are allowed to say, I do not understand. Please repeat the question. And that's what I did. Please repeat the question. The attorney did. I still didn't get it. Would you please repeat the question? He did. I still didn't get it. Well, after the third time I didn't get it, intuitively, I put on my professor's hat and began to ask him questions. I figured, well, maybe I'll get, I'll be able to elicit the information that he wants from me, I'll be able to get him to shape the question in a way that I'll understand it. So I began to ask questions 
and he began to answer me. And after the fourth question that I asked and he answered, he caught himself, he picked up his clipboard, slammed it on the table and bellowed, Dr. Brescia, you are not in your classroom, you are in my law office. I am the one asking questions here. You answer, I ask. Well, as you can imagine, I got flustered, I got embarrassed, I turned beet red, I muttered an apology. The attorney representing my client leaned over and whispered, You're su he's supposed to get under your skin, you got under his skin. Sweet. He thought it was great. I was just appalled and embarrassed. I, after that experience, I found a quote from Professor Ruth Milkman. Ruth Milkman was a historian in the 1970s and 80s, and she was an expert during the whole gender inequity cases brought against Sears Roebuck. Remember the department store Sears? There was a lot of gender inequity, salary uh, inequities, discrimination on gender, and she was brought in as one of the expert witnesses to talk about gender equality. She has this great quote, historians frequently disagree with one another, but it is difficult to imagine a forum less tolerant of the nuanced careful arguments in which historians delight than a courtroom. And I agree with Professor Milkman. For now, uh, these cases I'm involved in are on hold and I have yet to be called to give trial testimony. But I can assure you if that ever does happen, my stress levels will increase exponentially if I am summoned to do so. I wanna end my lecture this afternoon by inviting you to spend a few moments with me watching a YouTube video. It's an interview with James Maestas, president of the Acequias of the South Valley in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He and his fellow irrigators called Parciantes uh, in New Mexican Spanish. Parciantes, someone who gets to draw water, right? Their irrigators get to draw water from a tributary, part of the repartimiento system. Uh, Mr. Maestes, Maestes and his fellow irrigators share water as part of a deep historical tradition that dates to the late 16th century, the late 1500s in New Mexico. Although in his particular case, the water practices that he and his family and neighbors use date to the Atrisco land grant of 1692. I can think of no better way to conclude my presentation than to have you listen to his story, his own words, rather than filtered through a third party. Out of respect and reverence, he and his community deserve the last word on the importance of water to livelihood, to culture, and to promoting equity and the common good. Yes, I am. My name is uh, James Maestas. I'm uh, president of the uh, South Valley Regional Association of Acequias and a commissioner on the Acequia de Don Gabino Andrade. So the Acequias, the, the irrigation canals, or irrigation ditches that uh, provide water uh, from the uh, Rio Grande River uh, to all the uh, valley floor. Well, this, uh, this particular Acequia, uh, the Arenal, which is part of the Atrisco, uh, uh, land grant uh, goes back to 1692, so it's over 300 years. Basically, everybody that, uh, that lives on the valley floor has uh, water rights to the Acequias uh, because the Acequias, uh, when the land grants were established, in order for the people to uh, uh, complete their, uh, their claim to the land grant, uh, they had to irrigate and put their land to beneficial use. Uh, under uh, uh, American uh, law after 1848 uh, uh, and the uh, uh, war between the United States and Mexico. Basically, the territorial legislature went ahead and adopted uh, what were the Spanish uh, laws and, and regulations. And it's considered a property right. 
So uh, it can be, uh, after 1907, it could be uh, bought, sold, traded, uh, and so it's become a commodity as well. If you don't use your, your water, then it can be forfeited. Under, uh, under current laws, uh, it could be forfeited after four years of non-use if, uh, if the uh, Office of the State Engineer gives you a notice that, that, it, that it appears that you've abandoned it. Uh, but with that notice, you also get the opportunity to restore it to irrigation uh, within a year. Um, well, like they say in Espanol, uh, sin agua no hay vida. Without, without water, there's no life. And, uh, and in fact, even, uh, even down here in the valley, which looks pretty green, okay, we know it. Uh, any properties that are not being irrigated uh, basically only get eight inches of rain a year. And that means they're really like desert, you know? So, so you'll notice that land that's not irrigated looks just as dry as the top of the mesa. Well, uh, they're, uh, they're a valuable uh, and a historic uh, you know, uh, resource uh, to our community. Uh, you know, uh, for example, the, the South Valley is, uh, is considered a, a poor community, but, uh, but we're rich in that uh, most of us own land. Uh, we have the water rights to, to this water, and of course our children, and, uh, and those are priceless uh, resources. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention this afternoon. I hope you found the lecture informative. It's part of our history. It's part of who we are. And we need to share land and water because when you live in a desert in particular, we don't have any other choice. So again, thank you for your kind attention. And I'm open to any, not only questions you might have, but if you want to share some experiences or your own knowledge, we're welcome for that too. Thank you so much, Michael, for trying to demystify a very complicated um, history and legalities. It's, it's amazing what you know and how you've delved through the records to show things that from you know, 400, 500 years ago that are pertinent today to how we're living our lives. We have a few questions. I wanna grab the one in the chat because I'll lose it. Please put your questions in the Q&A because otherwise I'll lose them in the chat. Um, so Mia was asking, the US government required proof of ownership for the land that Mexicans and Spaniards owned before the Treaty de Guadalupe. It was taken away from them because under Spanish and Mexican law, they didn't require documents. Is there a law that would have helped them save their land? Well, Spanish, you know, that, that's a, it's an excellent question, but it, it's, it's complex because there are tons of Spanish documents, land grants, land titles, deeds, uh, I, I use them all the time. So the Spanish crown did issue property deeds and a lot of folks have them and they're still in circulation today. Uh, some of them were lost. Some of them uh, were stolen. Some of them burned when there were fires, uh, but there were other ways for them to demonstrate their ownership of land. So just title or a property deed was just one of several principles that a judge took into account when trying to establish water rights. So it was, uh, yeah, mo most scholars agree there were about seven legal principles and a property title was just one of seven. So you didn't have to have a title. In fact, Native Americans under Spanish law, most did not have a property title to their land base. And yet Spanish law un uh, recognized and protected their property. Although, as you saw with San Juan Pueblo, there were those who, there were excursions, incursions, I should say, incursions on their property, and they did lose some of their property. But other Pueblos under Spanish rule actually grew and expanded their property, right? And I'm thinking of the Pueblo of Sandia, for example, in New Mexico. So, so it's a great question and very complex. Okay, I have several others. Um... Marilyn would like to know, she said, you mentioned all the people who make demands on natural resources. How would you see the land and animals acquiring an effective vote in discussion of water rights? How would you see their rights differentiating themselves from those of our benevolent aspirations? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there is a movement afoot. Uh, it's, it's bridging the environmentalist movement and the legal profession. And it's about giving rivers 
personality, making Rivers a person. In Spanish, they would use the term la persona jurídica, a juridical person, personality. And I'm talking about American law. And of course, there are environmental activists and animal rights activists that say animals that, uh, you know, like the wall that was trying to be built, the US government trying to build a wall under the Trump administration. They invoke the, uh, the rights of animals to be able to move freely back and forth. But at least in the, uh, the way it's been unfolding, it seems to be, it's gonna be difficult because there's still this larger cut and, it, and it's a Western concept. So it's not just United States, it came from Spain and Mexico that humans uh, are superior to animals, right? We are on the top of the food chain. And that, that's the perspective. So we decide what mother nature does for us and that mother nature also includes animals. So we're not there yet, but there are activists out there pushing to have rivers and then trees to be considered people. And you know, you could make an argument if the US Supreme Court says that a corporation is a person and their rights to free speech should not be restricted. Well, you're gonna, you're gonna see some clever lawyers now saying, wait a minute, we can apply that reasoning now to animals and rivers. So we'll see where this takes us. But another very good question, thank you. Well, sort of a follow-up to that is, won't it be impossible to maintain historic water rights with increasing aridity, I can't say that word, but the aridness Arid associated with the climate change aridity? Well, yeah, that, that's with all, whether it's Spanish law or American law. The, as this drought keeps dragging on, as population increases in the Sun Belt, the pressure on our water sources are just going to increase exponentially. Uh, you know, the, the, the intriguing and challenging part of all this is lawyers and judges then step in and say, well, wait a minute, this particular person who has a right to water, we have to determine their rights based on laws that date to, you know, medieval Spain. What does that mean for the early 21st century? And unless they abolish international law, that still has to be followed. So there's going to have to be some very smart minds in the room to figure that out. And, and uh, Alan, who asked that question, mentions that New Zealand and India have given rivers the legal status of persons. And I think that's a movement of, uh, in, in Australia, but it's not, it, it didn't pick up the steam as it did in New Zealand. So oh, thank you. That's right. Uh, India and New Zealand, New Zealand. Daniel would like to know, he said, the Ezequia model sounds similar to the Zanahero and irrigation model in Southern and Central Arizona and Southern California. Do they come from the same tradition? Um, do you have any ideas on the origin of the word Zanahero? And is it similar to Maya Domo? Yeah, so Sanja and Ezequia are synonyms. They both mean Ezequia, they both mean canal or ditch, and they both go back to old Arabic. So um, zanja, a person who runs a zanja or who administers a zanja is a sanjero, as you pointed out. And that sanjero has the same sort of responsibilities as a mayordomo does with an acequia. So they're synonyms. Sanja and acequia are the same, and sanjero and mayordomo are synonyms. So very good observation. And um, Marilyn had another question. She wondered, how does French property law compare to that of Britain and Spain? Mm -hmm. Well, the French uh, civil law property is very similar to the Spanish civil law property, since they, their true traditions come from Roman law. So in fact, when you look at the French civil law of property in New Orleans and Louisiana, it looked very similar to what Spaniards were used to. So there was a time when Spain controlled New Orleans and Louisiana. So the French living there, they had no problem with the Spanish law because, well, of course, they, in, in that particular case, French law was still in effect, but it looked very, very similar. So, and then if you, if you really want a big uh, history lesson, in the 19th century, when Napoleon comes in, he had established the Napoleonic Code, and that has a deep influence throughout Latin America including Mexico, although not much of an effect on what would become the United States, but certainly in a place, uh, Mexico, all the way down to Chile, South America, the Napoleonic Code is very important. And then believe it or not, the Germanic Civil Code of Bavaria, Southern Germany, Catholic Southern Germany, which very much influenced by Roman law, 
That also had a uh, big influence in Latin America in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Why? Because the civil law traditions matched up. So Bruce says, are any of the, all these hard long words for me, agitations you have testified for resolved? And can they be resolved given the differences in legal underpinnings? No, these are, these are, this is the litig, these are litigations that keep on giving, right? So that, it's like, it's that Christmas gift we all want that keeps on giving. Well, that's the litigation here. I mean, the little Colorado litigation has been going on since the 1970s, right? When uh, a Sarco mining company begins to say they want water, the little Colorado, the Navajos and the Hopis then start fighting and, and there's no resolution. What most folks hope for are negotiated settlements. And the Navajos and Hopis came pretty close back when the late Senator John McCain and um, who was the other one, Kyle, uh, Kylie, what was his name? Senator Kyle. They came, they hammered out an agreement, but it fell apart at the last minute. There were some activists on both sides, on Navajo and Hopi who didn't want it, uh, particularly on Navajo's side and it didn't pass. So the best hope really is negotiated settlement rather than litigation because, you know, a, Let's face it, attorneys are going to keep up bringing, that's their job. They're going to keep up bringing new points to be debated and argued, and the cases are not going to reach conclusion. And then throw in a foreign legal system, that's just, that tangles up. That tangles up the web, right, The as the wheel of emotion go in, so. So we have one more question here. It says, were, were there any Spanish land grants or water rights established in Utah or Colorado? Uh, not in Utah, Southern Colorado was part of New Mexico. So any of the land grants you find in the San Luis Valley uh, were issued when Colorado was part of New Mexico. In fact, there's a great case. It's uh, the state Supreme Court of New Mexico, Lobato versus Taylor. It was only decided back in 2003, 2004, um, invoked the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and, and invoked not Spanish law, Spanish custom and Spanish agrarian practices, farming practices, water practices, as giving these Hispanics access to a ranch that was privately owned by an American. Hmm. And the argument was during the Spanish and Mexican periods, the Hispanics had a right to go on that land to cut down trees to either build their homes or to heat their homes, cook their food. And that tradition, that custom still needs to be respected. So that's an interesting. Well, I think, I'm just checking. I think that is all the questions we have for Tim. Oh, wait a minute, nope, one more thing came in. Um, I'm thinking more of student development. Is there a curriculum in Native American law that can be introduced at the high school level so that young Native students should be encouraged to enter law resources, water, and land? Something developed at Native American colleges. I've seen many non-Native attorneys working for tribes. This would be interesting to young Native students. That, that's a great idea. What I would recommend to get, it, to get, it, get you started, uh, go to, well, there's several websites. Go to the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law, they have one of the best indigenous law programs, which in, with indigenous law students in, enrolled, go to their, they have a specific website, go under the indigenous law and look for contact folks there. Not just law professors, but students. That's one way to kind of get the ball rolling. And then I would recommend you go to the, you know, there are 22 tribal communities, you know, sovereign nations in Arizona, go to their websites and identify their natural resources unit. Some of them actually have outright water rights unit and identify who are the contact people there and start talking to them about materials, information, establish a collaborative framework. And maybe that's how you can build a curriculum. Um, also, you know, the Tono Atom have their own community college uh, in Southern Arizona. Go to their website, look for folks there that you can touch base with. Uh, San Javier Farm Cooperative, go to their website, look for contact people and see if you can start maybe, uh, you know, identifying like-minded folks who could help you build that curriculum. Do you know of any resources in, in Navajo land? Well, the Navajo, go to their website, you know, the Water Rights Unit or the uh, Department of Natural Resources. 
and see what's what's available there that could be downloaded and things. Nothing comes to directly to mind, but you'll have to just do the internet research to find it. Well, or thank contact you. the people, contact the people. Thank you so much, Michael. It's it's a lot of information. You you somebody put a a website up that um, may be of interest to people. Um, so thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it. Again, if you are a K through 12 teacher, please fill out the evaluation if you want professional development hours. If you're not a K through 12 teacher, please fill out the evaluation just to give us feedback. We very much appreciate you um, being here. We'll look forward to seeing everybody back here. Have a good evening.